basically, I will teach you how to go inside your own head conversationally, and what comes out of your mouth will go in your ear, <laughs> and you'll get a response. What kind of response? I don't know. But you'll detect it visually, auditorily, or kinesthetically. And I teach people how to get a response, and then how to refine the response. Uh, <clears throat> give me a response subconscious that, that means, yes, you're willing to talk to me. And I pay attention, exquisite attention. I might see a vision, I might hear some voice speaking to me, I might feel a physical sensation. Oh, thank you, that means yes, okay. Now give me one that means no. I get a no signal. Well, now I have a yes or no channel with my own subconscious. I can ask yes or no questions and get meaningful answers. I can negotiate changes of behavior and relationship. I can say, hey, I've got this habit I want to change. Can you help me out? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Is there something I could do or change for you that would make you more willing to help me out with this thing I want to change? Usually you get a yes. Well, okay, you narrow down what it is and you make a deal. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> a few years back, while I was very stressed, taking care of my wife, I started getting migraines. Now, I didn't get your typical pain migraines. My migraines were a visual phenomenon. In other words, I'd see all these dazzling little spots all over my field of vision. And with that, I couldn't read, I couldn't use a computer, I couldn't do anything. Very distracting. So I went in and talked with my subconscious. And I ascertained, through this process, that when I was under certain kinds of stress, he wanted me to stop what I'm doing and relax. Change my state. Become more relaxed. I said, well, I'm willing to do that, yes, but I need something from you. Because if I'm reading something important on paper or on a computer screen, I need to be able to finish that sentence, that paragraph, to finish up before I put it aside. And I can't do it if I can't read it. I want you to take these dazzlies and put them out near the fringes of my vision, leaving the center clear. And I'll get your signal and I'll respond to it. What do you say? And he said, okay. And ever since then, whenever I've had a migraine, it's just been this little thing in the fringes of my vision. And I respond to it. I kept my word. It's important to do that. And it no longer gets in the way of what I see. Very convenient. Wow. And we can do the same thing with physical symptoms of all kinds. We can change them, modify them, alleviate them. Wow. Powerful stuff. Okay, so negotiating new behaviors is something we can do. I have a method for doing that. I can eliminate phobias. Unfortunately, most people like their phobias because they think they keep them safe. I had a client once he was afraid of spiders. I said, would you like to lose the fear of spiders? Oh, no. Oh, no. Because if I did, I might not get a concerned when I'm around one. I might even touch it or pick it up or something. I'm scared of them. I don't want to do that. Well, what if you weren't scared? <laughs> well, <clears throat> that person actually got to where they lost the fear of spiders. And I had one in a jar. And I said, here, I took their hand, turned the jar over on their hand, and said, isn't that beautiful? Can you see its knees? And they said, wow, it's a beautiful creature. Yeah, that's how she responded before. <laughs> that was the before response. <laughs> My point is that anything that goes on with you internally that bothers you is changeable. And once you know how to do it, you can do it for other people. Now, I'm going to give you a similarly brief introduction to Ericksonian hypnosis. What 
is hypnosis? Anybody know? Change the state. Yes. Let me be more specific. There is a phenomenon that some of us choose to call trance. And it is not mystical. It is not control of someone. It is not strange and bizarre. It's normal. And everyone in this room goes into trance states every day. You're just not aware of them. So what is a trance? <clears throat> well, I showed you the diagram of the head with the brain in here looking out at the world and making the math. Okay. You have what is for you a normal way of paying attention to your experience. That's what allows you to make a map. When you pay attention to your experience in some other way, you're in a trance, by definition. Example. I'm living in Eugene, Oregon, and I'm driving to Portland each week for 107 miles. It takes roughly two hours. But the road is so boring that as I drive into the outskirts of Portland, more often than not, it feels like I've been on the road 20 minutes. How did I distort the time to make it feel like 20 minutes when I know it took two hours? 120 minutes. I was in a trance, a driving trance. Have you not had the experience as you're going to sleep at night, you lie down, you put your head on the pillow, and you go through this place where you're not asleep yet, but you're no longer really awake. Have that? That's a trance. It's a going to sleep trance. And if you wake up slowly, you'll go through another one coming out of the, out of the sleep. It's an altered state. <coughs> That's what trance is. Or you're watching television, and you actually get involved in the plot of a movie. And you get excited, you get sad, you get angry, you get... You're in a television-watching trance. That's not reality. But you react to it as if it were, sometimes. And maybe you jump when someone comes along and touches you on the shoulder because you didn't see him come in the room. You were so in that trance. Television trance. Uh, what trance? Tra television trance. Oh, okay. Television, yeah. So there are many different kinds of trance. They can be very useful. When I was first in training as a therapist, I learned self-hypnosis that was not Ericksonian. It was old-fashioned, classical self-hypnosis. <clears throat> and I had a job. I had a stack of documents, books, this high. I'm sorry, it was two stacks this high. One like that, one like that. It's about this big a stack of books. Each of the books was about this big by this big and about this thick. And they were all full of numbers. My job was to analyze the numbers. This was air pollution data measured by a government agency all around the country, like 50, 60, 70 cities with three or four locations in and around each city, measuring a dozen different chemicals in the atmosphere, 24 hours a day, around the clock. And I'm supposed to make sense of that. That was my job. Well, I knew that I had a problem going into that. So here's what I did. I went into a trance. And I got my subconscious to agree to photograph each page of every book. And I sat there with these books on the table, in a trance, and I turned the pages. Click, click. Each time I looked down, photographed with my brain. <clears throat> Later on, I had a conversation with my boss. His name was Pierre. And Pierre said, Bob, what can you tell me about nitrous oxide in Detroit suburbs as a day-to-day -day variational thing with traffic that comes and goes. And so I mean, that could be problematic. What, what can you tell me about it? Well, my initial reaction was, what the hell do I know about it? <laughs> oh, Detroit, did you say? In my mind, I'm going into trance and I'm finding the Detroit book. 
What was the date? Flip. Go to the right page and read the numbers. I did that. One of my first experiences using hypnosis on myself. Okay. You could do that. If you wanted, if you had a good reason to do it. Your abilities when you're in a trance are different than your abilities in a waking state. You could do all kinds of things you never realized you could do. I just mentioned one of them. There's a lot of things you can do. You can affect your own health. You can change the way you communicate. You can change your perceptions. You can play. There's play stuff you can do with hypnosis and trance. You can forget things you want to forget, or remember things you want to remember. You can even remember to forget, or forget to remember. No. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> what would that be like? <laughs> anyway, so... I'm prepared to demonstrate these things. I am preparing you for such demonstrations just by talking about them. Because what i found is people are actually fascinated by themselves about themselves. Uh, I used to do demonstrations when I was first learning Ericksonian hypnosis, which is really a powerful form of hypnosis. See, before, before Erickson, it was believed that some people can be hypnotized and not others. Hmm. Guess what? It's not true. Can everyone in here see my hand? Yeah? Well, you just demonstrated that you can be hypnotized. Because if I ask you to pay attention to something visually and you're able to do it, you're able to go into a trance. It's that simple. Now, there are people with various kinds of mental brain disorders and so on who can't do that and they can't go into trance. And if you're taking care of someone with dementia, they probably can't do that. It's too bad. I attempted doing it with my wife. It didn't work. The, the learning capability is no longer there. But I have hypnotized someone who is schizophrenic, and that's supposed to be impossible. Well, Erickson did it, so I figured I could do it, and I did. Okay. Schizophrenics are not easy to hypnotize because they go around all the time in a kind of a trance state. And so, using trance therapeutically with a schizophrenic is very tricky. I've only done it once in my whole career. I've only seriously attempted it once. And it worked. <laughs> but it took me weeks of working with this fellow to, to make it work. And then I had to trick him in the end. I had to let him beat me. See, he had this unconscious desire to beat the therapist. Okay. Well, Steve, you can put me in a trance, but you can't do any therapy with me. I'll show you. And that's what it was. He'd go into a deep trance, show all the signs of being ready for therapy, and the moment I said something therapeutic, he'd pop out of the trance and insult me. You dumb jackass, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> something like that. So I had to trick him. I had to let him beat me and still get the therapy. And I found a way to do it. Took a while, but I found a way to do it. So, hypnosis can be challenging to the person doing it, but you see changes in people instantly. And when you're eliciting positive changes, wow, that feels good. So I used to, when I was practicing, just learning Ericksonian hypnosis, I'd be in a room almost this big, not quite this big, and I'd invite every therapist in town to come and observe or experience modern hypnosis. And I'd have anywhere from five to 25 people show up. And they'd be sitting on chairs, and I'd be up front, two chairs. I'll show you the setup. <laughs> and next time, if you like, I can demonstrate. So I'd sit up front, and I'd ask for a volunteer. I want someone who would like to experience trance. 
I get a volunteer. Does anyone here, anyone here want a volunteer? Okay. Anyway, I would then talk to the person and they would slip into a trance. But I would do it in such a way that everyone in the room would go in trance at the same time. And they loved it. They got to be trance junkies. These people would show up again and again and again at these demonstrations because they really like being in trance. It's comfortable. And it's, you're learning stuff, and it's exciting. A little odd at first, because it's not something everybody knows they do every day. I remember someone brought a youngster with her to one of these demonstrations. She must have been about 14, and she volunteered to be the subject. So she came up and sat with me. And I said to the group, I'm now going to demonstrate with this extraordinary young woman, I'm going to demonstrate what I call hypnosis by minimal cues. And I challenge you to figure out or observe how I induce a trance in this subject. I'm going to seem to just look at her and she's going to go into a deep trance. And you probably won't figure out how I did it. But I do suggest you follow along and verify from your own experience that this is real. You can do that. Here we go. And I turned and I looked at this young woman intently, expectantly. And sure enough, she went into a nice deep trance. I was able to demonstrate some trance phenomena, things that people can do in trance. <clears throat> and everyone in the room was in trance because I set it up that way. And I just told you how I did it, but you might not have noticed. <laughs> anyway, so that's an Ericksonian approach. It's different. You won't find any classical hypnotist doing anything like that. This was different. Okay, And this was a woman who had not experienced trance previously, this young woman. With people who ha has anyone here besides Thomas? I know he has. Has anyone else here experienced hypnosis? No, no, no. no. Oh, how we doing? Well, everyone I know that has likes it. <laughs> it's really cool. I have an aunt who stopped smoking with. I think it was just one session, honestly. I yeah. don't know if I have to talk to her to be sure, but yeah. Can happen. Wait, mom. What? Weight loss. Weight loss. Many things. Habit change is the least of what you can do to this stuff. You can make characterological changes. You can make changes in people's illusions about themselves or about the world. <clears throat> a lot of things. A lot of things you can do. And of course, I combine this. I had people doing bioenergetic exercises and simultaneously going to trance during the exercise <laughs> because I structured it so one would enhance the other. The idea of dangling a pendulum or asking someone to stare into your eyes or what have you, these are not necessary components of hypnosis. They're stylistic. Anyone who can look at my hand on her class can be hypnotized. And you need to understand that when you're in a hypnotic trance, you are not being controlled by the hypnotist at all. It is a learning experience. We learn to go into trance. We learn to do things we couldn't do out of trance. We learn these things because it's nice to do it. It's fun, or it's pleasant, or it's useful to learn these things. That's what trance is about. All I do is I guide people's perception to where they're able to do these things. If they don't want to, they won't do it. Guess what? It's like 
when I said, look at my hand. You can say, no, I'm not going to look at your hand. Okay? Same thing with the trans induction. If I make a suggestion that you don't want to follow, you don't follow me. Period. You could, I will even tell your subconscious, be sure you don't do anything that you don't want to do while I'm talking with you. Be on guard. Watch out. I might tell you something you don't want to do, and I don't want you to do it. Oh, how about that? I teach people to protect themselves in that way. But really, the reality is that if you tell someone in trance to do something contrary to their morals, they not only won't do it, it will usually wake up from the trance and stalk angrily out of your presence. <laughs> they don't want to be told to do something that they think is wrong. And they won't stay in the trance for it. There's been experimentation done on this. I didn't do that, but Milton Erickson did stuff like that. He did a lot of experimental hypnosis. I have four volumes, each this thick, of the papers he wrote about hypnosis. Anyway, any questions on what I've shared so far? <coughs> How can I put myself in a trance to go to sleep at night? Oh, that one I can teach you very readily. Yes. Yeah. Because I don't sleep well. If you know how to go into trance, you can use it as a sleep transition device. Which means, I can go into a trance like that. Catch a few seconds. Once I'm in a trance, I could pretend not to be. As I just did. I'm in a trance now. But I've learned how to behave as if I weren't, more or less. You did notice a shift in my voice, I'm sure. Anyway, now that I'm in trance, all I have to do is ask myself to go to sleep. I'm not going to do that now because. You don't want to sit there watching me snore here. But if I did it, I'd be asleep right away. So I go into a trance state. I usually do a little meditation. And when I'm done, I say, OK, time to sleep. And it's like throwing a switch. I'm asleep. I'll even tell myself when to wake up. And I will wake up within a very few moments of the time I've told myself. So the subconscious is able to measure time pretty accurately. What it's not able to do is to have a sense of time. Your subconscious reacts to the events of your early childhood, even your infancy, as if they just happened yesterday. She doesn't know that that experience is long gone. And she may continue to defend against that experience, if it was unpleasant, as if the threat is still there. So I suggest to each of you, the thing you fear the most happened a long time ago and will never happen again. Promise. OK, so that was a demonstration of sorts. I use some hypnotic technique on myself. I use a little on you. It enhanced the communication, did it not? It's really simple stuff. But it takes a little getting used to because the subconscious does not think about life and the world the way your conscious mind does. Your subconscious mind is more childlike in some respects. And your subconscious might like to play pranks, either on you or on someone else. Yeah, if you're very capable of playing pranks on people. Like the guy that popped out of trance and told me what a jackass I was. <laughs> he was schizophrenic and he was, a, he was a combat vet. Traumatized combat vet, also schizophrenic. Oh, what a case that was.